Mr. Kip Sorensen, good to have you back. As you noted before we hit record, I was riding solo last week, and they're just not nearly as good when I'm riding solo. So I'm I'm glad uh, to have you here. Don't take it personal. It's the same for both of us. It's uh, <laughs> how always was, good uh, to have the banter. It is. How was uh, how was New York? It was good. Um, we lived there. You knew that. We lived there for yep. a few years, and so our daughter's never been to the city. Um, and a lot of people may not realize this. New York at Christmas time is actually quite festive. And yeah, so, it um, so it was great to take them to the city and go to Rockefeller and go ice skating and go to the Rockettes and, you know, and, and celebrate some Christmas. So yeah, cool, man. It was good. Yeah. yeah. I saw some videos and some pictures and it looks like you guys had a good time in the, uh, the hell hole that is New York city. Um, but like <laughs> you said, it actually, it, I, I, I like a rural, more small town feel. That's where I like to live. But I yeah. uh, I worked with a financial firm that had their main office, their headquarters on Hanover, I believe, in lower Manhattan. And so I uh -huh. usually went once or twice a year and I, I loved it. I would go and check out the city and go to Times Square. And my wife and I went to Broadway a couple of times and we just had a really good time. It's good to go. And then it's good to get out of there too. So totally, totally. Yeah. yeah. The, the, my thing, when people ask me like how I like living there, what I loved about New York was just the energy. Yeah. <laughs> there, everyone is hustling, bustling, like, and I, I like it, but it's also exhausting. And then there's just a bunch of crap, you know, in the city that you're just like, man, you know what? I, I, even the thought, in fact, I was having the conversation this morning, even the thought of like Manhattan lose power for two weeks, what kind of chaos would occur? Oh, I wouldn't even. I mean, that, yeah. And that in itself is like, tells you, geez, that's a problem, right? It, I live in an area where if the, if the power isn't there to regulate people, to ensure that they actually choose a moral high ground in regards to how they show up in the world and it all goes to shit. That's a really bad sign. You know, that's and, everywhere. And obviously I mean, not that a place to live. That is everywhere. Obviously it, you know, in New York, you've got, it would be the numbers, the mass hysteria, but that's everywhere. Rural Maine, backwoods, Maine, uh, Northern Utah, New York. That's, that's literally everywhere. Uh, my friend, Matthew Arrington, a mutual friend of ours was telling me about a book. I got to find the book. Maybe you guys know what it is. If you're listening and it was it's it's fictional book, but it's based on the real events of I think when Venezuela became more of a communist country, if I remember correctly. Mm. And it talked okay. about how quickly there was just mass hysteria and chaos. And you know, you thought it was bad when people couldn't wipe their asses with toilet paper. So there was a big frenzy on toilet paper. Wait till they can't drink water. Wait till they can't drive their car, wait till they can't get on the phone with somebody like that. That's when, or get food. You think it was bad yeah. then just wait. And it really doesn't matter where you are. It's going to be everywhere. Mm. That's why yeah, I like know um, what that book is. Yeah. I'll have to figure it out. If you guys know what it is, let us know. Um, but that's why I'm a big fan of uh, what Mike Glover is doing with American contingency and Fieldcraft survival. He's been on the podcast yeah, that stuff's just crucial. And we just live in ignorant bliss, myself included. And I, I don't I don't rarely do I think about how hard life would be if things went really south. We just had a big snowstorm, actually the biggest snowstorm since we've been here in three and a half years. And it was manageable because the roads were plowed and I have a plow and we have the heat and the power stayed on. And if it didn't, we have a generator. So it was all manageable. But with it being the largest snowstorm we've had in the past, like I said, three years, it became apparent really quickly how bad it could get, like really bad. Yeah. I mean, just imagine the system that we're so dependent on, right? In your example, it's just like, all right, the highway, they they end up not plowing it all the time. Just that in itself, all of a sudden, like, oh shit. Or, yeah. you know what? Truckers start shipping money or food into Walmarts how that affects me. Like we are so dependent on this, the, or the, our social system to work out. And if it, if something doesn't work in that system, <laughs> chaos, other yep. chaos to your point. Yep. Hmm. Well, sovereignty, let's, uh, let's, right? 
sovereignty. I mean, to the degree that you can, sometimes, you know, I've, as I've been a little bit, uh, more aware and conscious and, and trying to like unlock the mental and emotional side of, of my life that maybe I haven't in the past. I still believe in individual sovereignty. And it's amazing how often that word is used in circles that I run in now. I mean, we, we use that word, you know, we, we kind of yeah. brought it to, I think to the market and it's cool to see everybody using it, but at the same time with my own personal mental and emotional work, and then also trying to regain the spiritual aspect of my life. It's a bit of a, I was going to say a misnomer. It's not a misnomer. It's just a bit of a comforter to believe that we have everything <laughs> figured out and that we actually are sovereign. So I guess what versus, I'm saying, yeah, versus you're just a, not in control. How much is out of your control? Yeah, <laughs> you're just not in control. I mean, you're really not. And look, I'm not saying that you get to absolve yourself of taking care of yourself financially and your fitness and all of these things, because what that does do is it helps us to manage what we don't have control over more effectively. It doesn't yeah. give us any more control. It just helps us yeah. manage it more effectively. And I'm learning that in a lot of ways, the hard way. Uh, so do, I, I'm kind of thinking, man, should I have renamed that something? And no, I still like that. The message is, it still makes sense. It's still accurate, but we need to realize how little is within our control and how much is without outside of our control and just focus on what we can and man, just get comfortable with the rest. <laughs> Yeah. All right. But All we're right. going to field questions today. And then also something that is in your control, guys, is the Iron Council is open. It's open right now through the end of the year, maybe a little bit longer to get those of you who are kind of stragglers and getting a late start on January 2023. Uh, guys, I'm telling you what, this is the best iteration of the Iron Council. We have the best systems in place. We've teased out all the kinks and all the bugs not all of, most of, we've continued to evolve. We've continued to adapt. Than it was. Trying new yeah. things. Yes. A hundred percent. I think we've got over a hundred guys that have already signed up in the last several days. So it's going to be an, an amazing end of the year and then roll out into 2023. So if you want to know what the iron council is about, go to orderman.com slash iron council. There's a two or three minute video. Actually, I don't even know. Maybe it's five minutes, but there's a video there. You can watch learn what we're all about. And then of course you can get registered and we kick things off January 1st. So if you sign up right now, we're going to get, get you onboarded a little bit over the next week and a half or so, but really January one is the word where, where the work begins. So hold on to your butts. Cause it's going to be a killer year. Yeah. Do something about it. Right. Yep. Get on the court. Yep. All right. So we're fielding questions from our Facebook group um, to join us there. Go to facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Dominic Francione has two questions. You want to fill both of them since since Dom's a good guy? Because it's Dom. Or do you want to you choose know, if one? If it was anybody else, we would maybe not. But because it's Dom, we'll do both. Okay. All right. Because he's a shredded old man. All right. He yeah, says, he uh, so we'll do the softball. The softball question first. Uh, favorite okay. Christmas tradition. Why is it valuable to have these traditions in your life? And Merry Christmas, he says. Uh, Merry Christmas. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if we have anything like out of the ordinary or or unique. I mean, uh, we usually sometimes we cut down a tree, but the last couple of years we've actually got a tree from the tree lot that's just down the road. It's a little fa family farm, and I like supporting the guy. And he has some nice trees, and we pay forty bucks, and we get the tree. So that's that's yeah. kind of nice. Um, maybe, each year we maybe do maybe ornaments, the... like we do we like different ornaments. Our tree is not mm -hmm. the uniform macy's type tree like it's ugly it's got all kinds of different weird ornaments but it's sentimental everything on that tree means something so that's kind of cool yeah. every year we pick out an ornament my wife got me a moose a head, a, a head of a moose this year because breck and i had our moose hunt so that's of cool. course it broke the uh broke the branch once they hung the moose head on it but um just it looked awesome ripped the tree down <laughs> actually we just decorated the moose head we didn't even do a tree we just wrapped some lights around the antlers, <laughs> lit his eyes up, and it's perfect. Uh, what else? Um, you know, probably this, like I said, the same as everybody else. We we usually, as a family, will open one present the night before uh, Christmas yeah. Eve. We spend time usually with friends. Christmas falls on Sunday this year, which I'm actually kind of excited about. So we'll go to a Christmas program on Sunday. 
Uh, even the night before, there's a Christmas Eve pro- program at a church. I'm looking forward to both of those. Our pastor is he's he's a strong person. He's a moral, principled person, and he's willing to say it like it is. And I admire that about him. So, uh, I, and he's always well versed and well researched on on his message and spends a lot of time and in, in preparation putting that together. So I'm excited to hear that. Uh, yeah. So just the usual, as far as why it's important. So, I mean, obviously we got to remember what season it is. It's not just Christmas shopping. Like yeah. we're, we're, we're honoring the, the birth of Christ, literally the most important person to ever walk the face of the earth. So I think it's kind of important. We understand why in the world we're doing all of this stuff. And most of it has nothing to do with the birth of Christ, but also I think it helps you forge deeper connections with family. You know, we can laugh and joke and play and have things that we look forward to and time that we spend together. And there's a lot of value in that as well, obviously. Yeah. And and Dom kind of, he, the exact verbiage he wrote here is why is it valuable to have and keep these traditions alive? And, and I, what I like about that is what's ironic is if I did something really cool this Christmas and we didn't consistently do it. What's the probability of my kids even remembering that? It's actually really low. What they remember are the things that we consistently did, aka traditions. And yeah. so I think it's valuable to keep the traditions alive because it solidifies us as a family in a way that that otherwise wouldn't. If we are inconsistent and we're not kind of those traditions mean something. They add meaning, and that meaning is family is important and us coming together and the love that we felt with one another. And and I think by doing traditions, especially if we're able to add a lot of um, associated meaning and lessons around them and why we do them and reiterate that, then that solidifies the message that we're trying to teach our kids. And so I, I think for me, it's, it's, those are the things I remember are the traditions when I was a kid. And, and that that's what I've latched onto probably more than anything else. You hit on something that I think is important with regards to traditions outside of just Christmas traditions, but traditions are typically rooted in symbolism. Like you said, they have meaning. You know, why do we give gifts? Well, that's symbolic of the gifts that that the the wise men gave, you know, to to Christ, right? So if we don't keep these types of traditions alive, then we sever the tie between where we are now and where we come from. And if we don't know where we come from, then it's very difficult to, for us to remain a principled people. We can't have principle in, a, in our lives if we don't know what our fathers taught us. And that's, I actually get really frustrated with, I think this is common for every generation. And at some point, hopefully like the prodigal son, they come back to their fathers, but it's very frustrating to see the disconnect between kids these days. And I just say that as I get older and their you lack of connection, yeah, their lack of connection with their ancestors, with their, I would say elders, you know, we, we take our elders and we put them into nursing homes and we discard them and we mock them and we like, Oh, there's crazy old grandpa, you know? And it's like, well, crazy old gran- grandpa built this nation. And yeah, cognitively, maybe he's slipping a little, but also there's some wisdom in that, in that brain of his, there's, there's some, yeah. there's some sage advice that he has in his, in his heart and his mind and his soul. And I get frustrated when we collectively as a society forget about it and replace our traditions with new inferior traditions with new inferior idols. Like we worship ourselves. We even parents more so than ever, I think worship their children we, we, yeah. it's, it's horrible and it's not principled sage time-tested wisdom because we've forgotten and uh, uh, those lessons and we've discarded that information as being antiquated or outdated or old school. It's like, well, maybe they were onto something and I'm not saying we shouldn't be progressive. There's a lot of good that younger generations can do with the tools that are available now that weren't available 50 years ago. But maybe there is something to what our grandparents had going for them. And we ought to preserve totally. that to the best we can. Totally. You know, it's an interesting thought on that, Ryan, is by us, you know, if we grab the elders scenario, by us not seeing the value in them, 
uh, and degrading the value in them and respecting them, then it makes our transition of becoming elders even more difficult. Because oh. if I don't see the value in my elders, then as I get older, what am I thinking? I'm worthless. You, you know, like my transition to become an elder is is disrupted by me uh, giving a lack of respect to the elders that came before me. Well, what are you what are you teaching your if if you don't honor your elders, you don't honor your parents and your grandparents. What are you te teaching your kids about you? Mm, yeah. <laughs> like, are Sorry. they going to honor you? Of course not. You don't honor future or previous generations. Why would they honor you? So we're conditioned yeah. and it's going downhill. What was the second question? So Dom's second question, if you don't care for the Christmas one, he says, what are your plans and projections for 2023? How can we help support your vision and mission in this coming year? I don't really know. Um, I That's a... That's a question I get asked often. I think we addressed it in the Iron Council a couple of weeks ago because somebody yeah. asked about this. I don't plan that far out ahead. And I, I do it by design because I don't want to be so rigid that I can't adjust and pivot as necessary. Uh, you know, opportunities present themselves. Sometimes we get hit with unforeseen, unfortunate circumstances that we need to deal with. And so we need to be able to pivot. Uh, that's not to say I don't know where I'm going. I know the direction we're going generally. Like I have the heading, for example. Yeah. But I don't exactly know how I'm going to get there because I really don't know what's over that hill. I have everything I need. I know where I'm going. I know that I'm going to deal with obstacles and opportunities. I just don't know what they are yet. So I'm not going to pin myself down to that. I don't do one-year planning. I don't do five-year planning. I don't do 10-year planning. I know what kind of person I want to be. I, I know where I want to take this organization. And I, I think it must be frustrating when there's planners who listen to me like, well, what's your plan? Yeah. What are you going to do? How are you going to make it bigger? How are you going to got to map that out. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I, I just, I'm not interested in that because I also have other things that are important to me too. So I know what kind of man I want to be. I know I want to, how I want to show up. I know how I want to work. And, you know, there might be speaking engagements. There might be order man chapters. There might be another book. There might be this, there might be that. There's a million ways it could happen. They're just not in front of me right now. Not fleshed them out yet. Got no, it. No, because I haven't even spent time thinking about it. All I know is that, hey, here's where we are. And I, I like the heading that we're at. We're doing good things. We're growing. We're expanding. We're influencing more people. We're we're getting into the hearts and minds of more men. And let's keep do, excuse me. Let's keep doing that. Okay, Christopher Sharp. What do you teach your son when he comes home with his first busted lip? Well, that would depend on what. How did he word that? What do I teach my son? What do you teach your son when he comes home with his first busted lip? Uh, I'd teach him how to keep his hands up. <laughs> I mean, it depends on the situation. Like, yeah. did he, did he start did he a fight? Did he the get fight? busted in the, hit, yeah. in the face? I'd be like, well, there you learned your lesson. Or was somebody picking on somebody else and he stood in and, or was he defending himself because somebody was picking on him? Like, Whatever the situation, I'd have to play it by ear. So if we play those out, if he's defending somebody else, um, I, I would say first and foremost, know what you're getting yourself into. Because yeah. there might be situations where actually it isn't appropriate to get involved. And there are situations where it would be appropriate. So we definitely have that conversation. Uh, if he's defending himself, I would, I would continue to teach him martial arts. We would do that together. Hey, if you're going to get in yeah. fights... I got to know that you can, you can hold your own. Uh, and I would want him to, I'd want him to be capable of taking somebody down, of, of subduing somebody, of punching somebody, of, of passing them out. Like I'd want him to be capable of that. Um, if he's instigating the fights and he's become the bully, we would talk a lot about humility and, and why we as men are to protect people and, and look after them, not take advantage of them. So there's a lot of different lessons they can be learned. And by the way, I'd probably teach all of those lessons regardless of the circumstance. Yeah. Just in case. Yeah. Well, yeah. and just take advantage of the opportunity, right. To teach all those different lessons. Yeah. But I think first and foremost, don't get punched in the face. <laughs> Avoid that. 
You know? Yeah. Like right. I was Nick watching Elliott. a video the oh, other day. God. Yeah. I was, I was watching a video the other day and it, it looked like, uh, two guys were maybe in, in front of Walmart or a grocery store or something. And they got into a yelling match confrontation. And then one guy had, he, I think he had his hands in his pocket and he took his hands out of his pocket. And immediately I was like, all right, like disengage. Like this is that just changed. The situation just changed. And the guy that he was in a confrontation with did not observe that. And next thing you know, just whack, just knocked out. punches him, hook, you know, right hook, drops him, and then, you know, proceeds to kick him in the face and the ribs while he's down on the ground, knocked out. So <laughs> keep your hands up, keep your distance. Like, wh why are you fighting? Why are you yelling with grown? You're a grown man. Why are you yelling with another grown man? Why are you letting another man in your space like that? Like, keep him at a distance. Know where his hands are. Know what weapons. Know where his buddies are. Like, get, why are, why are you in that situation in the first place? Yeah. Like, what, you know, what in your right mind got you into that situation? I know what it was. You weren't in your right mind. And then, if you're Ego. gonna be in that yeah. situation, like defend yourself. I mean, how easy would it for somebody to punch you? You drop. They get a knife, stab you, kill you, or shoot you. While you're past, like, don't yeah. go down. You can't go down. But yeah, keep your hands up and keep your distance. Nick Elliott, do you ever get inspired for a podcast topic from the posts that are made in the Facebook group? Yeah, that's what we're doing right now. Like, we're. Yeah, but I'm thinking, like, guys are talking about a particular oh, yeah, subject, and you're like, hey, yeah. Yeah, I what I do what is I look asking. for trends. I look for trends. Um, so if I see, you know, several posts over a week or two about um, relationship issues or financial hardship or uh, addiction issues, um, you know, usually it's an issue that somebody would have that would continue to get brought up. Or, or if somebody has an issue and it happens to be a really hot post, like very controversial, there's a lot of conflicting perspective and viewpoints on it, but it's really highly engaged. I know that's something that men want to talk more about. So yeah, I'm always, that's part of the reason the Facebook group is so good for us. It's good for you guys because you can talk to each other and some advice is better than others, but you can get different advice and different input. But for us, it's good because we can have our pulse on what's important, what's trending, what topics you want to talk about those sorts of things. So yeah, I'll always looking for inspiration, not just from Facebook, but Instagram, uh, or maybe a new book comes out. That's really popular by another author. I might want to dive into that and figure out why that topic is so relevant. Um, if Jordan Peterson's talking about a thing and it's important, then I'm like, okay, well, you know, do I have something interesting to add to that conversation? I'm not just, I'm not just going to jump into a conversation if I don't have anything else that's interesting to say, I'd, I'd want to have a differing viewpoint. And, and I do look for that, you know, if Jordan Peterson says one thing and I'm like, well, I agree about with about 80% of that, but 20% of that, here's why I don't agree. Then that's a conversation worth having, not, Hey, let me just regurgitate let me Jordan regurgitate, Peterson's yeah. 10, you know, talking points. So yeah, I'm always looking for that inspiration. Copy. Chris Gent, I just started the masculinity manifesto and you said in the opening that men seek fulfillment rather than happiness. Most philosophers, and it appears some biblical thought, is that all people seek happiness as a supreme thing or idea of assertion to however you say. And I think you also quoted Jordan Peterson stating that fulfillment is the highest thing to seek. But wouldn't fulfillment in something end in one's own happiness? So how do we rectify philosophy and biblical thought against the newish idea of fulfillment or have, or have I not read far enough yet? I kind of got well, stuck in the mud because I'm always coming back to this idea that fulfillment leads to happiness. So there's a lot of things here. Number one, I mean, we might just be tripping over semantics a little bit. So that might be something we can talk about. Um, also, people often quote like studies, and I know he's not quoting a study, but people will say, well, you know, studies show that dot, dot, dot to support their argument. And then you're like, well, what studies? And they're like, well, just studies. Well, like which ones, like, show me what study you're talking about. And he's yeah. pulling this, he's pulling the same little trick here. 
He's like, well, the Bible and philosophers say that happiness is important. Show, show me where in the Bible it says to chase happiness. Yeah, like, I disagree the with the translation yeah, of I, happiness, well, or is that the English version of happiness? Like, <laughs> I, like, I want to know where in the Bible it says that you should always chase happiness. Like, show me which philosopher says to go chase happiness. Like, I, I disagree with the assertion that you're making. So the rest of the conversation is kind of a moot point. No, the, the yeah. Bible does not say to be happy. The Bible does not, or, or excuse me, philosophers, there's no philosopher I've ever heard of that says, hey, the ultimate goal of life is just to be happy. Like mm. The Bible taught, think about how hard it is, for example, to be a Christian. Like you've got to fight against every fiber of your, your human essence to be a good Christian. You're not supposed to be angry. You're not supposed to envy. You're not supposed to steal. You're not supposed to covet. You're supposed to love your enemy. Like that's hard. And to me, when I hear happiness, it's like, everything's fine. Everything's perfect. Everything's wonderful. There's no problems. There's no issues. That's not life. Now I do agree that at some point, especially when it comes to Christianity, that we will ultimately, the goal is to have eternal life, which I consider to be in the presence of God. That to me would be a definition of happiness. We are now in the presence of God. So let's address your, your point that you made about fulfillment versus happiness. Yes, fulfillment does lead to happiness. So what do we focus on, happiness or fulfillment? Fulfillment. Because that's within your control. And fulfillment is pursuing something meaningful and making yourself capable of achieving and or dealing with it. That is a much better way of living. Christianity is a wonderful way to look at this. You are to get as close to acting like our great example, Jesus. We're talking about, you know, obviously with it being Christmas. If that's your goal, it's to chase and to pursue his word which is challenging. It's difficult. It's hard. We'll be tempted. We'll go through horrible search situations. And yet we find meaning in the suffering of trying to achieve that thing. So no, no, the Bible does not talk about being happy over, over being fulfilled. No philosophers don't talk about being happy over being fulfilled. Fulfillment is the way look for something meaningful fix your sights on it and then make yourself capable of dealing with all of the baggage and bullshit and challenges and struggles on the path to achieving that level of fulfillment. Yeah. I've always, I've always made the distinction between peace and joy and happiness. And I know it's just semantics, right? But, but I, I feel there's a big difference uh, to be at peace with oneself and to experience joy um, versus happiness. And, and I think the definition of happiness is like a, a state of being satisfied or whatever. Right. And, um, you know, and, and, it, and I, I guess what I'm trying to say is it goes back to kind of what we're talking about here is what, based upon whose definition of happiness. Yeah. I mean, is it excitement? Is that what you're saying has happiness or are we talking about peace and joy and the sense of like no regret? knowing that you lived your life to the fullest. That could have been a really tough life, but would have a huge sense of fulfillment with minimal happiness until maybe they're at the end, but maybe not, you know, maybe it was just peace that you'd be feeling. So I actually, I really like the word peace and even joy, like you're saying, because, well, I'll give you an example. And you guys know this. Every one of us has made mistakes in our lives, some yeah. to varying degrees. Right. And we've all made a wide spectrum of, of bad choices in our lives. How in light of the horrible choices that you've made and the consequences that you've had to deal with in your life, find peace. How can you find peace in being a loser? Cause we all are right. We all have, yeah. we all have, have done bad things. We've all sinned. We've all taken advantage of other people. We've all uh, taken things for granted. I mean, there's so much that we've done. How do you find peace in that? 
Is it the absence of hardship? I would consider that happiness. No, it's not. It's that you've made yourself capable of overcoming that. It's that you yeah, that you resolved it, you grew better. Yes. Yeah. And you can yeah. find peace in really difficult situations, bankruptcy, job loss, medical things, relational issues. You can find as ma a man peace in spite of all that. In fact, I would say maybe because of it. Yeah. And and to, in your example, when I think about those situations for myself, I have zero happiness about any of them. Right. You don't want that. Like, of I, course. I don't want any of those. I, I wish none of those things occurred. So I, I don't, right. not happy about it, but I'm at peace with them. Yes. Because I grew from them. I like that. I like that a lot. I'm glad you, I'm glad you shared that insight. But again, let's, yeah, thanks let, for having but, me on. Well, you know, I pick pretty good. So, <laughs> like, so let's see how many like ways that we can pull it back to ourselves. Compliment like, each pick, other. It'd I be pick great. great. No, not compliment, <laughs> compliment ourselves. Like, I pick great co hosts. Oh, yeah. You know, well, so. it's just because I showed up so powerfully that you're capable of even seeing my greatness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I do. Your point is well taken on what are we talking about, even with what do you yeah. mean by happiness, fulfillment, joy, peace? You, you guys might have differing definitions and that's fine. We can discuss it. But really when you're having these types of discussions, it's important to define the words because I've found a lot of the times that the people I'm debating with, I'm like, oh, we actually believe the same thing. We're just calling it something different. Totally. Yep. All right. What's next? Totally. Dwayne Jones, my wife and I found an unusual mole on a toddler about a year ago. Doctors initially told us not to worry about it but we watched it grew and eventually got referred to a dermatologist. His appointment is on the 29th of this month, but I find myself struggling heavily with anxiety and worry about what the results may be. Mm -hmm. Any tips on how to frame this and keep myself from stressing to such an extent? He is my only child and the thought, however remote of him going through such a terrible thing as cancer or even losing him is often nearly too much to bear. It weighs heavy on my mind at all times while I work, which I has not, which has made it rough. Yeah. Well, this goes back to first, I'm sorry to hear that you're going through that. I, I have not personally had to deal with that. I, we really haven't knock on wood, had a lot of health scares with our children, minor things, you know, illnesses, yeah. RSV. When I think my second son was really young RSV. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing significant. So I can't imagine what you must be feeling. I'm, I can't imagine it. I, I could certainly imagine it. And you might I mean, you're, you're jumping to some conclusions here as well. I'm not trying to diminish totally. what you're going through, but you're jumping to conclusions. Obviously, I'm not faulting you for that. Obviously, you're doing that. But this goes back to what we talked about earlier, sovereignty. Like you're learning. <laughs> like You think you're in charge. No, you're not in charge. Nothing you could have done or not done that would keep your child out of this precarious situation they're in right now. Or how much you worry is not going to change the outcomes of whatever that appointment goes right. on the 29th. Right. So, but let's be practical here because we, if, if you're anything like me, we're worriers and we're worriers. I'll tell you why I worry. Cause I want to fix it. Yeah. I want it to be better. I want the situation to be better. So I, I worry be about it. Yeah. yeah. I worry about it because I'm like, okay, well, if I worry, then maybe I can come up with a solution to the problem and then everything will be better. Yeah. The problem is a lot of times we worry about things that there's no solution to. And there isn't right now. You got to wait 10 days, probably 12 days, because then it's going to be two days to get the the labs back. So let's be, let's be realistic about that. So your anxiety is not going to go away because you're a doer, you're a fixer, you're a man. So here's what I'd suggest to you. Redirect the anxiety. Redirect it to something you have control over. And I don't know how old your son is. You said he's a toddler, so maybe four or five six, maybe top somewhere in there. I would guess. Um, I don't know if your son is, is worried. I don't, I don't know if that's a conversation that you've had about what's going on, but there's some things that you can do with your son based on the conversations you've had that might help him. So your worry can be directed towards making sure he's comfortable and he knows, and maybe you do some research on it or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Your wife, if you're worried, bro, your wife's worried. She's probably worried 10 times or more of what you're worried about. So maybe you can redirect some of your own selfish worry. And it is selfish. You're, you're, you're thinking about yourself right now. 
is redirect it to her. Hey, hon, look, I've been thinking about it. I'm, I'm nervous. I'm worried. I didn't even think about how you must be feeling. Like, can we, can we do, um, you know, let's, Hey, I put together something, uh, for Wednesday night, we're all going to go to the movie and then we're going to go to the tree lighting thing, or I don't know, whatever. I'm just saying direct your anxiety towards the people who need you to step up and lead in this scary situation. That's all you can do. The anxiety is not going to go away. You just direct it towards things you actually have influence over rather than things you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's some value. I mean, I, I don't want to diminish how he's feeling either, but like there's some value in, you said it, focusing on how you're being selfish and how you need to be able to serve. And, and so I'd ask you, are you serving your son and are you serving your wife? with your current level of anxiety? Are you doing what's best for them? I think we should riff on the selfishness thing. Cause I think a lot of people might hear that and say, he's not being yeah. selfish or even, or even this gentleman yeah, might enough. say, I'm not being selfish. I'm thinking about my kid. I know, I know you are, but also you're thinking about yourself, right? Cause I'm at like, play this out. If it were me, I'd be like, oh man, if my son, goes through this, then we'll have to go through chemo and then that's going to be expensive. And then it's going to take all this. How can I afford that? And, right. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to play the game because you're already have anxiety. So I'm, you can play it out. I, I don't need to do that. You've probably already, already played it out in every situation imaginable, but I bet at the end of it, it all comes back to how would we deal with this? How could we handle this? And you know, that's a dead end right now. You don't need to worry about yep. that. And, and what's the stoic philosophy? I mean, it's like, you know, the, the majority of our suffering is in our imagination, you know, 80% of it's in our imagination and 20% is reality. Um, and I can relate to this, right? I, I remember my oldest son when he was in the hospital, um, luckily for us, actually the hospital that he was born in, in Phoenix did newborn hearing tests. They started that month. And by the oh, way, wow. just so you, everyone understands the importance of this. What would typically happen when you have a kid with a hearing loss at birth, it would go unnoticed for a long time. Then they would go through, they would go through like, uh, you know, their toddler years. And then all of a sudden they'd be diagnosed as like slow learners, right? Everyone mm. would go, oh, he's slow or he's mentally challenged. And then you would end up throwing him in like a mentally, you know, challenging school because he's not learning well and everything else. When in reality, he hasn't been hearing you for the last five years. And that's why he's not speaking and you would not even know that. Right. And so that's why it's such a big deal that they actually do these newborn uh, tests. And yeah, so we found out that he had a severe hearing loss at birth, literally within weeks of being born. And I, my ignorance was he's deaf, like a hundred percent deaf. Guess what our anxiety was? He's never going to be able to listen to music. He won't be able to talk. It, like we didn't even know. We don't know what we don't know. Right. And, and I made it like, it was earth shattering for us to have this perfect baby that his life was going to be so miserable, you know, with this hearing loss. And we were going to go through all this heartache and pain and suffering. No, not at all. Actually. It wasn't like in the grand scheme of things, it's way worse that he's losing his vision. Right. But yeah. But nonetheless, the anxiety and the meaning and the the sadness that we had about around it was way worse than actually once we started dealing in reality. And so, you know, just consider that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sean Gearhart, uh, on church men's groups, almost two years ago, I got super involved and led groups and started getting into entry-level church leadership. When COVID lockdown started, every single one of the guys in that group refused to meet up. We developed relationships for nearly a year before this. I tried for almost six months to get the group together with no avail. I was hurt, angry, and for other reasons, we moved several states away. And I've told my wife I have zero interest in trying to again, uh, trying again at our current church. I have no friends here at all. It's work home, work home. My wife keeps telling me I should try to get involved, but I just don't have it in me. Am I alone? I'm a lone wolf most of the time. And that's mostly how I operate the best. 
but hearing you always talk about having other men in your corner, I wonder if I'm missing out. I have a military background and I currently work in asset protection and I'm very much a social introvert. Any advice on the course of action? Yeah, you said you don't have it in you. You actually well, do you, have it in you. And you had it in you before, right? Obviously. You're just hurt. And so you're yeah. calloused. Like I know that's, as men, and he's a, he's a military guy, it's like, I'm, yeah. I'm not hurt. I mean, you're hurt. <laughs> Screw these like, guys. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, you're hurt. You were offended. You said it. You were offended. You were upset. You were, you, your, your feelings were hurt. And so now you, you change your course of, and your, your course of action has been, if we're going to use military terms to retreat, like you've given up, you've surrendered. You're like, oh, well, you know, like I was offended. And so I don't want to feel offended anymore. So I'm going to surrender. That's what you've done. So I'm not going to do this again. Yeah. Right. Cause you don't want to get hurt. And I understand, I get it. And you know, it, it pisses me off when I put a lot of effort into something and people don't reciprocate or get involved the way that I feel like they should as if I have control yeah. over them. Right. That, that, <laughs> that hurts, that stings. And so you've got to ask, I think first and foremost, why does it sting? What does it say about you? And I know what it says about me when people, when I, when people do things I perceive as rejection and they may not even be rejection, but I perceive it as rejection. I feel unlovable personally. Yeah. Like that's, and this goes back to that work I t was talking about doing. I feel like I'm unlovable. That yeah. comes back from when I was a kid. And there might be some things that you're experiencing here. I'd also say you had some weak friends. I mean, let's not overlook that. You know, guys wouldn't even get together with you years into the this quote unquote pandemic. I understand two weeks. I understand a month. But after a month, you know, normal people kind of figured out, okay, got it. I know what's going on here. And th those are weak. Those are weak people. Like I don't, and the church you were attending was weak. I don't know how else to say it. That's the reality of it. So you're now taking an isolated incident full of weak people and you're projecting that onto your current congregation. And you said, well, you know, I'm an introvert. What does that have to do with anything? Like that, that that's just your label so you can justify your current state of being. Let's it be doesn't frank. mean that you can't, I agree with that. It doesn't mean that you can't be around other people or that you shouldn't. You also said, I don't know if I'm, better off being a lone wolf. You know, that isn't true. Otherwise you wouldn't have asked the question. You, yeah. if you were completely content and you thought it was wonderful by yourself, you would, this wouldn't be bothering you. It wouldn't yeah. be an issue. Yeah. What's an issue is that you got hurt. You were around weak people. And also one other factor is maybe what you weren't doing wasn't interesting enough. That, that could be, you know, like let's look at all angles here. I mean, I, I'm not trying to beat up, beat on you. I, I, if I was in this situation, I would want to know all angles and maybe what we we're doing just wasn't resonating with the guys. And so there might be some opportunities there to ask, what would the guys be interested in? What would engage them? What would compel them to be here? Maybe the guys who didn't come were using COVID restrictions as a convenient excuse not to participate in something they didn't really enjoy that much. And there's so yeah. many, so many different ways we can take this. But I, I think the biggest thing is you've surrendered because you're hurt and I understand, but figure out why you're hurt so that you can actually have friends. Like I think having male friends, I think your wife is right. <laughs> like having male friends, didn't she say something? My, did I just make that up? She said something, right? Yeah. I mean, she was, she wanted him to get involved again. You know, yeah, but she didn't necessarily right. call out friends. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, she's agreed. right. You need to get involved because you know what? That actually, here's one thing. That actually might be her way of saying, you're annoying the hell out of me. Like you need to get out of the house. <laughs> Truly. Like, yeah, I she knows what's, what's good for you. I don't want to, like you, I got to have you out of the house. Like you got to, you got to go have friends. Like you got to have another outlet. I cannot be everything to you. Like you got to go. And she, just because she loves you, it's not because she doesn't want you around. It's because she loves you. And you said it. She knows what's best for you. She knows you. 
Yeah. She's she's What's, covertly telling you what you need. She's right. Yeah. Right. Maybe answer this question because I I think there's some value here. You know, part of me when I read this, I was I was saying, well, why did you start the group in the first place? It was about you, or is it about mm. them? Right. And so there's a level of like, why do you start a men's group and not making it about you, but making it about the men's group? But but let's be frank, like. He might be doing this to create a tribe and guys that yeah, he wants cool. to be around. It's a good reason. And 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 there's some superficialness to that as well, right? And so wh what does that dichotomy look like in serving a group versus creating a group for your own personal benefit? H how do you process that? I don't think it's wrong to create a, a group of friends for your own personal gain. <laughs> like Okay. You're not doing anything wrong. You're not taking advantage of of people. You're not manipulating people in a negative way. You're not. Um, you're you're not. Uh, yeah, it's not immoral. It's in fact, I I would argue it's it's the opposite. It's you want to have a good group of men around you <laughs> because you know you'll be better off when you do. That's great. Uh, I don't I don't see any any sort of dichotomy with with that. You know, it's like a it's like when you tell your Tell yourself, you know, I have this, this, my son or my daughter, and I'm never going to love another kid the same way. And then you have another yeah, one. Then you have another one. Yeah. But, but no more, like two's <laughs> the most, because there's no more room yeah. for love. And then you have another one. You're like, oh, wait, do I have more room? Cause like I said this before, no, I don't have any more room. And then you have another one and you're like, okay, I got it. Like it's abundant and relationships, healthy relationships are abundant. You don't, when you, let me think about how to say this. A lot of times, and men, I think, feel this more than women generally, is we believe that if we're getting something out of a relationship, then we're taking away from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, like me and my, me and a buddy of mine, actually, we had some friends over last night and uh, one of the, one of the wives that came over, her husband was the because of all the snowfall, the chicken coop had collapsed. And so that husband didn't make it over. It was me and another husband and then three ladies, including my wife. And I was, I asked about the chicken coop. I'm like, Oh, is he getting it? Does he need help? Like I asked about it. And my other buddy was like, how come he didn't call me? He's really good with woodworking. Like he'd be a good person to call. He's like, how come he didn't call me? He's like, Oh, he doesn't, he doesn't like asking for help. He doesn't like that. See, that's a scarcity mindset. We all do yeah. that. It's like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to impose. A... And then one of the women said, well, you're denying somebody a gift of service. I'm like, bingo, bingo. Really? By asking a friend for help, you're not taking away from the relationship. You're actually Forgiving. adding to the relationship. You're giving that person an opportunity to serve you. That's a beautiful thing. And you benefit because you have that person's help and they benefit because they know what it's like to serve and they have an opportunity to do it. It's an, relationships are always in abundance. You can't, in a moral way, you can't get out of relationship more than what you put into it. You yeah. can do that immorally. You can take advantage of people. You can steal from people, but in a moral way, you cannot take out more than what you give into it. I like that. Dirk Harima, I'm about to be divorced and we have a three-year-old daughter. What would be some examples of creating struggle for my daughter so she knows how to be mentally and emotionally resilient? I believe she needs to still have a feminine side, but I also want her to be able to stand up for herself and not quit when things get tough. I'm just like, make her change her own diaper. I'm like, she's three, bro. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Uh, just shove her every so often yeah yeah just like trip her <laughs> and then laugh give her a flat hey, tire and then laugh hey dirk's be dirk's be I proactive know. here he's, he's i know planning. i'm just giving him let's I'm, let's i appreciate dirk break. i appreciate it we're just busting your chops a little bit here uh first of all i'm sorry to hear about your divorce change your own diaper change your own <laughs> diaper <laughs> actually dirk you try that and let us know how that goes that's gonna be great <laughs> oh okay you're cooking dinner tonight yeah. Uh, well, again, what I was going to say is I'm sorry to hear about your divorce. And that's, that's a horrible thing. Um, I don't, I don't like that. I, I wish you didn't have to deal with that. So, but again, dealing in reality, here you are for whatever reason. And there's some things to examine. I hope you are. Um, 
Yeah, three years old, I, I was joking because it is a little hard. But one thing I would suggest is, are you doing hard things? Are you mm -hmm. doing difficult things? Or are you sitting around dwelling on your divorce? And I don't know, I, I don't, but are you sitting around dwelling on your divorce, getting fat, being lazy, being wallowing in your own self-pity? Like, is this the behavior or is the behavior I'm up? I'm in the gym. I'm working hard. I'm I'm doing this. I'm actually communicating with my ex because that can be a challenging thing. Like, are you doing the challenging things? Because she's going to pick up on that. The culture that you yeah. create in your house, not with her necessarily directly, because again, she's three, but the things that you're doing are, be, are going to become commonplace. Like if yeah. you get up and you guys wrestle every single morning, at some point, she's going to have a conversation when she's 15 or 12 or 13 with her friends. And she's going to be like, wait, you guys don't wrestle with your dad every day? And it'll click that her life is not normal compared to everybody else's. Or wait a second. You guys, you guys don't go on 10 mile runs on Saturday morning with your dad. Like, I just thought everybody did that. Right. Yeah. You can create that. So you do it by the way that you show up pra uh, practically for a three-year-old. You know, I think, I think they probably to some degree can learn how to clean up their messes. <laughs> I think yeah. that that's a, that's an important thing. Um, I think there are some conversations, I, you know, I'd love to, I, I think I'd love to see you have her help you cook dinner. Like, Hey, sweetie, like, why don't you season this and put, you know, don't give her a bottle of pepper, but maybe give her a little lid of pepper and she puts the pepper in the soup. Right. Like, yeah. Things like that, where you can get her involved in, to, to a degree, I think will go a long way in fostering the relationship that you have with her and then building up this toughness and this resiliency and stuff like that. Uh, as far as her not being feminine, it sounds like maybe mom's not as active in the picture based on what I'm hearing. So I would suggest to you that you get her around other women. So maybe you have a sister that can take her to get, you know, her, her nails done. I'm not saying getting your nails done is what, a, what the, yeah. like a feminine Everyone don't approach. lose your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe <laughs> grandma can take her for the day and they can do whatever it is they do. You don't even need to know, you know, within reason, you don't even need to know because you're not going to get it, but get her around other feminine women. If she's not around mom, I think that would be really important. Yeah. And I, and I think in those younger years, you know, you, you having a family ethos in regards to how you show up as a family and looking for opportunities to reiterate that. Uh, I, and I think for me, like a, the black belt move to this, and this is a pitfall of mine or a has been in, of mine is I, I'm all about building resiliency, right? Go outside, do X, Y, Z, go pick up the garbage you know, mow the lawns, clean your room. Like I'm all about dictating resilience. Oh yeah. Problem is they don't learn any of that unless I'm actually doing it with them. So the black belt move, unfortunately, is when you're teaching your daughter to clean up your room. Guess who's cleaned up the room with her? You yeah. are. You're going to have to show her that you can actually do it. And that's doable and everything else. Right now I have a four-year-old and literally yesterday was Okay, buddy, clean up your room and then we'll play Uno because he wants to play Uno. Go clean up your room. But dad, it's so hard. I'm so tired. Like like his legs <laughs> melt and he can't do anything, yeah. right? And so I'm like, okay, fine. You know what? We'll go, let's clean it together. I'm going to help for a little bit and then you do it by yourself for a little bit. And then we show him, you know, and then I leave and then we play Uno. Then we come back and I help him some more. Like, if I just left him in his room and laid down the hammer and said, no Uno until your room's clean, I I completely did not take advantage of the opportunity of teaching a lesson. And instead, I, I went command and control and I coursed and belittled in the sake of having a room clean and did not teach him anything. Yep. You got, I talk about it in the book. Um Brett Bartholomew introduced me to the concept of compliance versus commitment. You got them to comply because if they don't, they don't play Uno. So they complied, they'll comply, kicking and screaming, yeah. or you get them to commit. And it's not about the room being clean. I do the same thing with my yeah. youngest. He's six and 
we love Legos. Him and I build just about every day. We build Legos and uh, it gets a little messy in there. And so we clean up and he's like, dad, I hate cleaning. I don't want to clean. I get it. Who wants to clean? But you know what? If it's clean, then when we come tomorrow, we're looking for that one perfect piece. We'll know exactly where it is. Yeah. Oh, Lesson. Okay. You know, so yeah. Yeah. It's a good, Principles we were just Legos. giving you a hard, we were giving you a hard time, man. But, uh, I do appreciate the question, although we were, like I said, busting your chops a little bit on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like the, uh, change your own diaper Dirk. Yeah. You're probably overweight and you're probably, <laughs> I'm like, geez, man, way to project a Dirk here. Poor guy. <laughs> no, All I right. didn't say probably again, <laughs> just go. We, I think we talked about this. You're I reject the premise that go back, rewind the tape. I did not say you're probably overweight. You're probably late. I didn't say any of that. I didn't even allude to that. Oh, okay. All right. That's, I don't know. Jake Dykus. Good day, gentlemen. I'm curious about the early days of the podcast. And if you were both uh, battled imposter syndrome or any other limiting beliefs along your journey while embarking on this mission, did you ever feel ill-equipped or measure yourself up to other prominent voices in the self-development field? How did you handle it and push through? The reason I ask is because I feel called to embark on a mission myself. Some days I feel like I'm firing on, sil on all cylinders, and there are others when I feel as though I will never be good enough to make the impact I desire to make. I battled this inner critic often, but was wondering if either of you guys could relate and could share some wisdom on this topic. Think for Thank you for all you do. God bless. You will never be good enough. Actually, that's true. <laughs> there you go. Way to, <laughs> way to speak positive to him. <laughs> you know that inner critic? That shit's not going away. You know what? <laughs> Suck it up. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I wish I could give you a happier message. We can talk about the, the birth of Christ coming to redeem the world at the end of this podcast to get everything back on track, but I'm just, I, you're never going to be good enough. Like you won't. And that's okay. It's okay. How do you do like, with the low days? At least I just say, this is a low day. Hmm. And then I go to work, you know, when I'm struggling in the relationship, I'm like, Hey, this is a, t a moment in time. And I, I can do things. I can be better. I can work on myself. When I'm dealing with financial hardship, it's like, okay, yeah, this sucks. We're eating beans and rice and okay, what do I need to do about it? Like, how can we eat fancier beans and rice for next meal, <laughs> you know, until we can get to the point where we're not worrying about that. And we are, and I am, yeah. you know, there was a point in life where it wasn't. Uh, so you're never going to be good enough. Just acknowledge that, but know that you can get better every single day. And being on the path is enough. Like it's enough to be on the path. And by the way, with comparison, people have a really weird relationship with comparison because we all hear comparison is a thief of joy. No, it isn't actually. It gets it, it taken to the extreme. Yeah, sure. It can rob a lot of your own self-belief and put you in a tailspin of, of depression, but in a healthy way, there's guys that I admire, um, Andy Frasilla, Pete Roberts, Jocko Willink. I mean, I, I hesitate to name people because there's so many guys that I admire and respect that I would consider are doing bigger and better things than me. I don't, that doesn't hurt my feelings. It doesn't make me feel bad about myself. It's like, whoa, that guy's doing something awesome. And I want to do something awesome. Maybe if I do more of what he does, then I can actually do that. Yeah. And that's how I, comparison can be very valuable. I want to interject really quick. It creates possibility, right? It, it's no different yes. than when people beat a world record. All of a sudden, once someone beats a world record, all of a sudden, a bunch of people beat the world record. Why? Because mm. it makes something that was not possible, possible. Right. So it's good, right? That you have Andy Priscilla, that you have these people to go, oh man, it's possible. I could do that. Like- Imagine if there's zero Joe Rogan, right? Right. We, no one would ever imagine how far a podcast could go if he hadn't already taken it there. We'd all be like, yeah. oh, there's a max limit to where this thing will reach. Well, now we don't know. 
the max limit is like way high because he took it there. And now that is a possibility. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't, I just wanted to inject. No, it's great. Um, let's hit on an imposter syndrome. I have never, I can confidently say that I've never dealt with imposter syndrome because I've never projected myself that I have everything figured out. Like you're, you've never once heard me on the podcast and go back and listen to almost a thousand podcasts. Now mm -hmm. tell you that I know it all that I have it all figured out that I'm God's gift to the men's movement. <laughs> you're just not going to hear that from me. In fact, you're yeah. quite often you're going to hear the opposite. Here's what I struggle with. Here's what I'm dealing with. Here's what I did. Here's what I should have done here. Like that's what you're going to hear from me. I'm not an imposter. Because I'm yeah. honest about what I'm dealing with and where I'm struggling and, and how, you know, far I have to go. And so the best way to overcome being an imposter is to be real. Be authentic. Yeah. Just be real. Like, so true. guys, Hey, I want to start this movement and I feel called to do it. That's real. Um, I don't know why I feel called to do it because I don't feel like I'm worthy of doing it. That's real. Uh, I, I don't feel like I can lead men. I feel like half the time or more, I can't even lead myself. That's real. Uh, I'm dealing with overcoming alcoholism. That's been something I've battled with for two years, but I'm getting a handle on it. That's real. Like, yeah. and you know what? All of that stuff that I would normally be afraid to share about myself is actually what connects me to the people who want to do this mission together. That's what yeah. makes it worthy of being in this battle. Because if somebody sees you as untouchable, you they can't relate. They just cannot relate to you in any way, shape, or form. That's why in the movies, we love the protagonist who isn't perfect, rough around the edges, got some real baggage in his history, and yet has overcome some thing or multiple things and is now able to, you know, move on to accomplish whatever the task at hand is. That's basically the right. premise of every movie. Why? Because that's your life. Yep. And so you have to relate with Rocky. Like if Rocky is, nobody relates with the Russian. Like we don't like the Russian because he's Russian and because <laughs> he's perfect. So we don't like him. So but we like Rocky right? yeah, because we underdog. know he's the underdog. We know he's not supposed to win. He's not supposed to be there. He's got a troubled past. He's, you know, from a, a broken family, uh, got yeah. a dark background. He's He's got logs to lift instead of perfectly machined equipment. Like that's, we're Rocky. We're not the Russian. Rocky four. Yeah. That's the only Rocky, yeah. right? Like, yeah. Well, we're. That's why we resonate with that because that's our life. That's how we yeah. see ourselves. And here, here's the kicker. It was on the Rocky, on the Rocky uh, symbolism here. While you're an imposter worrying about what kind of Rocky you are, the people in your life, who are they trying to be? Rocky. They don't give yeah. a shit about you being Rocky. They're worried about being Rocky themselves. Yeah. So sure. while while you're while you're so focused on Oh, well, am I going to show up in this really powerful way? Guess what they're worried about? How they show up in a really powerful way. That's why story brand marketing is so critical that you market your products to make your customer the hero, that you don't pitch yourself as a hero because no one wants to hire you because you're the hero. They want to hire you to make them the hero and you're the support cast. The same thing even goes into learning, right? You you gave some examples, Ryan. I, I did some leadership training last week for our internal leadership team. My, me going into that leadership training, my mindset was what? My na natural ego instinct was what? Man, I better present really good so I look good. And so I look smart and blah, 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 blah. Well, guess how learning works? All that I can do and you, Ryan, and other people who teach people is we can facilitate something. That's it. It's the people listening to us that actually determines if they're going to learn something or not. That's not controlled by us. And so I was like, wait a second. No, no, no. My objective in this training is to do what? To present ideas 
and topics and suggestions for people to consider it for themselves. Right. So then my focus was, how do I present the right things for you guys to consider what I'm talking about? But it's not up to me whether they learn or not. That's actually their choice. Yeah. Right. And so sometimes, at least for me to get past that imposter way of thinking, it's because I'm worried about looking good. Let's be frank. And I'm so paranoid about work looking good that I've lost sight of really the intent of what I'm trying to accomplish. And you use this analogy, you know, about, you know, you'll see your full potential when you're willing to light yourself on fire and let people watch. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I've always liked that because what, who does that have to do with? Does it have to do with you looking good? No, if anything, it has more to do with you willing to possibly look bad for the sake of benefiting others. And that's where the real impact shows up. You know, what's ironic about it. The less that you present yourself in a way that shows that you're flawless because what, well, let me back up. Why do we do that? Because we want the validation of others. Yeah. But the more you do that, the less validated you'll feel. Yeah. And the less you worry about how others perceive you and you just share what is authentically real, the more people will allow themselves to be influenced by you. It's yeah. an ironic thing is we think what we should be doing actually produces the exact opposite results of what we actually want. Totally. So it's weird though. It's, it's, it's like this, it's, it's, it's so hard. It's like, it's, but it's, it is, it's counterintuitive, but it's almost just cruel. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I want people to like me. Well, you know what? The less you worry about people liking you, the more people will like you. And you know, what's funny about that. And then when they all like you, it won't even matter. Yeah, because you got the right a, state of mind that it's not critical. It's yeah. just a cruel reality of life, but it yeah. is. So and Jake, about we say yourself. this, and we say this from the position of like this is a natural. Like at least for me, this is hard. Like I get it, right? So I'm not saying that like, oh, this is not a problem. No, this is totally a problem. Like I have to remind myself constantly that like why I'm doing something and making sure I'm not doing it for my own validation, my own purpose and looking good, right? It, it is a, a constant struggle. Well, I mean, a perfect example of that. I, and I agree with you. A perfect example of that for me is, you know, three weeks ago, making that post about alcoholism and sitting there with my hands shaking on whether or not I was going to submit this post, literally my hands shaking, yeah. like, do I do this? And the thought crossed through my mind is, Somebody will be better because you send this out. So send. So I did hit send. If it was just about maintaining my own persona, no way in a million years would I have ever put that information out into the world. But I knew somebody else would be served. And so you start sharing the truth, not my truth, the truth. And the truth is that you are a certain way and you're good at some things and you're not good at other things. And you do well in some areas and some facets of life for periods of time. And you don't do so well in other facets and some periods of time yeah. in your life. That's the reality. Yeah. It'll be a posture. One more question. Take one more. You good for one more. Okay. Greg Johnson, what fatherly advice can I give my son who just graduated college? He doesn't seem to be doesn't seem driven to do much besides work, drink, and go camping. Should I care along as he is taking care of his own life? Well, yeah. I mean, should you care? Of course you should care. Yeah. Is that what he's saying? Should I care? Yeah. I don't know if I'd give, yeah. give you fatherly advice, but here's one thing I would do. Turn the credit card off. Yeah. If that is- Kick him case. out of the house. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if it's true. Stop paying for his bills. Like- that might not be fatherly advice, but that's fatherly conduct. All right, son, you're on your own. Good luck. And if he gets into me, trouble and it's significant, you know, you're going to be there, of course. But, you know, it might be time yeah. to give him a little bump out of the nest. I don't know if it's if he's there or not. I just, I, I just yeah. say that the best thing you can do is not to treat him like he's 12 and treat him like he's 19 or 20 or however old he is. Let me, well, let me rephrase Greg's question. Sorry, Greg, I'm going to steal your question. So 
So Greg's Greg Sidero and maybe other guys, right? Uh, kid out of high school, uh, maybe out of college, working, all right? Maybe they're living on their own, but maybe not as ambitious as you would want or wish they were. Maybe they're not getting after it in life to your level of expectation. What father advice would you have then? I don't, I wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to say? Just because of the age. Yeah. Like what, like, what are you going to say to your son? Like, son, I really need you to work harder. I really need you. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> You've been saying that. Like what, what more could you say? And what way could you say it that you haven't already said it a thousand times? You know what you can do is let him experience life. Cause you did the same shit just like I did. Let him experience yeah. life. And then maybe talk about something else. Yeah. Just hey, make sure son. that you, he knows you care and love for him. And, right. Hey son. Yeah. Um, you want to go to lunch on uh, on Saturday? Sure, Dad. And you know what? He's going to go thinking you're going to hound him and harass him and bother him about all this stuff. And you're like, hey, bud, like, you seen any girls? Yeah, I'm seeing this one. Oh, it's awesome. Tell me about her. Well, what else is going on? Oh, man, work sucks. Yeah, work is hard, especially when you're entry-level stuff. That's horrible. Yeah. Like, don't even offer advice. Don't offer yeah. advice. Don't counsel him. Don't, don't scold him don't tell him what he's doing or isn't doing or this just like be there and just like ask him about his stuff like you've already done it all i guarantee you. you're asking yeah. the question and i admire it i mean you care clearly there's just yeah. nothing more you can do at that point point. and when they're ready and they want to ask for advice they will yeah yeah for sure and then and then be there and be ready to do it you know or or may yeah. and i would even say i would even hesitate on that you know, if, 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 if my son, my, my oldest is 14, if he's, you know, in the next four or five years out of the house and he's, I don't know if he'll be going to college or working, I don't know, whatever. And he comes to me and he asks for advice. I, I hope, I hope that I'll have enough wisdom to not just barf advice all over him Yeah, and just say, well, I don't know, son, I, man, I dealt with that too. What, what options do you have? And he'll hopefully come up with a handful of options and I'll say, hmm, yeah, A and B sound pretty good. C sounds like a horrible idea because that's what I did. So just be aware of that. But um, what are you going to do? Oh, I was thinking A because of that. I'm like, yeah, try it then. See how it goes. What's the worst that could happen? Well, you know, maybe this or that. Yeah, and then you can just change from there. Like, isn't that yeah. a way better conversation isn't that f more fun to have anyways with your son than trying to like chastise him or guilt him into like not drinking beer or not liking girls? I mean, come on. Totally. Yeah. That's my thoughts. I like it. All right, gentlemen, a couple of calls to action really quick. So Iron Council membership is open in between now and the end of the month, maybe a couple of days or a few days into January. To join us in the Iron Council, go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. Um, we would recommend that you get in now. That way you're kind of set up and ready to hit the ground running at the beginning of the year. Um, once again, uh, orderofman.com slash Iron Council. To join us in the Facebook group, go to Facebook group uh, facebook.com slash group slash Order of Man. Um, and then another thing to call out is uh, Masculinity Manifesto, uh, Ryan's latest book. Get it wherever you purchase your books. And then to, to connect and follow Mr. Mickler on the socials, that's at Ryan Mickler on both Twitter and Instagram. Anything else, sir, that you'd call out? Yeah, when you were talking about the Facebook group, I was like, don't even join the Facebook group because if you're serious about it, you'll just join the Facebook group and then come over where the real action is into the Iron Council. So just skip the Facebook yeah, group and go straight to the Iron Council. It's open right now. So just go right there instead of the us. roundabout way. It's like, to me, you know, it's it's the the quickest or the straightest, what is it, the shortest path between two points is a straight line. It's like just yeah, it's like a dabble right. putting a foot in in the ice bath, right? It's like you know, just get your just, body in. You know, it's good for you. It's gonna suck a little bit. You know, you're gonna have to pay a, a little bit of money, and it's gonna yeah, of course, yeah, right, okay. So, but so what? Just do it. You know, you're gonna do it. So just do it. Yeah, that's I my like pitch. It. I like it. <laughs> my pitch. My pitch. And Merry anymore Christmas. Is like, just do it. Uh, yes. Merry Christmas to you. Great time of the year. Um. 
you know, we don't, obviously we don't talk a whole lot about that. We, we, we dabble that in as things get brought up, but yeah, it's an, it's an amazing time of year. Remember why we have this season. The birth of Christ is kind of important. Um, try to have his spirit, you know, with you and in your home and in your relationships and just in your heart too. You, you know, I, I just, I feel like, again, I'm, I'm, I'm working through my own spiritual journey and just that, that, that spirit, just having it in my heart is just better. <laughs> it's just, it's just better. It just, things feel better. Life has a little bit more color, a little bit more meaning. It's interesting. It's just better. So I hope you guys find it as well. Cool. All right, guys. Great questions. Appreciate it all. We'll uh, be back on Friday. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.